This interview was recorded on January 14th, 2021. Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing special guest Simon Collinson. Currently based in Toronto, Simon has extensive experience in the book publishing industry, including his time at Kobo as a senior manager for business reporting and his work as co-founder and digital producer at Tilted Access Press. He'll soon be moving to Vancouver for his new role as publisher business development manager at Press Reader Subsidiary Textbook Hub, where he'll be onboarding publishers and supporting schools in the adoption of digital of digital textbooks. You can follow him on Twitter at Simon under score Collinson and check out his website at simoncollinson.com. In this interview, we're going to talk about Simon's background and professional interests, his experience in the book publishing world, and his views on some of the trends in book publishing as we enter 2021. So thank you, Simon, for being on the Front Matter podcast. No worries, Len. Thanks for having me. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you eventually made your way into book publishing, the book publishing world. Yeah. For sure, for sure. I, uh, I'm i Australian, uh, and uh, I've been kind of bouncing around the English-speaking publishing industry for a couple of years now. Um, started out as a as a print bookseller uh back in back in adelaide australia and uh, sold books at a dimix dimix bookstore for five years and did a, a bunch of interesting things there um i edited a student magazine and uh but but then i did an internship in 2013 uh at a company called vook in new york uh which i don't know did you ever encounter vook uh yeah it rings a bell yeah, so they were at that time a uh, they they had started out doing uh, video enhanced ebooks was was their idea, and then they pivoted to uh, basically services for other other brands. New York Times was one of their clients, and kind of putting together ebooks for other companies. They pivoted a few times, ended up becoming the uh, the book distribution platform called Pronoun, uh, and then they got acquired a few years later. So. Yeah, they they pivoted a bunch of times, but there it was a really interesting place. And I, I came along in 2013 when the ebook market was just kind of exploding, and I thought, huh, this is interesting, ebooks. Um, so I came back to Australia and started making ebooks as a freelancer, and then moved over to the UK, uh, did a master's in publishing over there, and uh, worked for a company called Canelo, uh, which started out as an ebook ebook only publisher, and now they're doing really cool things with print on demand. Um, and then met my wife, who's Canadian, and and we moved to uh, moved to Toronto a couple of years later, where I started working at uh, at Racket and Kobo, and just left Racket and Kobo now after three years there, and, and started a textbook hub. So, yeah, that's kind of the the one minute potted history. But uh, I guess uh, I should mention along the way, I I started uh, a, a radical non uh, sorry radical non profit press called uh, Tilted Access Press with my friend uh, Deborah Smith and. We've been publishing books in translation uh, ever since, so that's kind of the the side project. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to talk to you about Tilted Access Press uh, in just a bit, um, but I, I'm looking just looking at your profile here on LinkedIn, and um, I see you also spent some time in the UK. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I, I did a, a master's degree in, in publishing, which is uh, kind of one of these things now, I guess, if you want to get into the, especially in the trade side of the industry, uh, but but really any side of publishing, you you have a lot of an advantage if you if you have one of these master's degrees. And so I did that, and uh, and then worked for for a couple of different publishers before I uh, landed this job at at Canelo. So yeah, three three years in the UK. Three years. Uh, and were you in London the whole time? Yeah, yeah. Um, different different places in London, you know. I mean, anyone who's lived in London uh, will know that as a student, you you end up moving, you know, once a year, if not if not more frequently, because, uh, you know, you have housemates and they move out. And uh, so, yeah, I actually lived in, I think, three, maybe even four different places in those three years. But uh, I saw a lot of London, yeah. Uh, I, so long time listeners of the show will know that I lived in London for about eight years or well, I lived in the UK oh, for about eight years and I lived in numerous locations in London as well. And so um, for a bit of, we'll, we'll only talk about this for a few minutes, but it's actually always interesting to me because I've actually talked to people who like are currently living in a neighborhood where I lived in London. Um, so if you, I'll, I'll, I'll just enumerate where I lived. I lived in um, Balham, Golders Green, um, Chelsea for a while and um yeah, I'm even forgetting place. So I lived near Angel uh, Station yep. and, and near the city for a while. One of my jokes was that, you know, I, you know, if you had one Aussie roommate, you had at least two. Um, <laughs> there was always someone else there. Um, yep, that's uh, true. That is very true. So where, yeah, can you tell us some of the neighborhoods that you lived in? Yeah, so I, I lived uh, for a year near King's Cross Station in... Uh, uh, what's uh, the the thing I always tell people is it's the prison on the Monopoly board. Uh, whatever the 
whatever the name of that street is, I've, I've temporarily forgotten. But anyway, in the uh, kind of the rough side of Kings Cross, uh, right, yeah. not not the nice, the, not the nice Islington part that you lived in. The, uh, the part <laughs> just a bit west that was a bit rough. Uh, and then I lived in Brixton for a year, which was fantastic. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and then a year, then did a year in in Dalston, uh, which was also a very very cool neighborhood. I was the least the least cool person in that in that part of London, but it was a lot of fun. And um, this is this is a very specific question, but so I often wondered what it would be like to be a student in London with so many kind of like so many things to do. Did you did you find it difficult to uh, stay focused? Yeah, it, it <laughs> well, it was a little hard to concentrate sometimes, but I, I think you know I the the fun thing about being a being like a a student in a professional degree, I guess you could call it, uh, is that a lot of the a lot of the fun things were tied up with the publishing community. And one of the great things about the UK is they have a very strong, uh, very vibrant publishing community in London. And I mean, you know, that's the the flip side of that is that you have to be in London to access that community. And you know, you're on a publishing salary trying to, uh, you know, drink fifteen pound gin and tonics at fancy clubs but um <laughs> yeah but, i know but, yeah. i know that <laughs> life but yeah i i loved i loved london it was uh it, it's a great it's a great place to be as a young person i think and uh a lot of people i think spend a few years there and move on yeah it's interesting um uh, just to share a brief story i mean you know it, it actually really does i mean it's a little bit different now with um sort of things going so virtual under under covid and things like that but like where you are can actually be a huge privilege in 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 the publishing industry and like i remember you know i wasn't even it, even adjacent to it but i'd studied english and had a had a friend in london who just said hey i've got someone who's got like um a manuscript of the latest michael and Dace novel they need someone to proof it and so i yeah. got i got like just printed out from Microsoft Word early version of yeah. Neil's Ghost. And I just wow, that's it, had, cool. it hadn't been published yet. And I just like had it in my apartment to read. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's and cool. like that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been in London, like not in a million years. That's I think that's one of the things that people in publishing secretly really love and they're a bit embarrassed to admit it is is that having that access to uh, to things before they get published, you know. Um I for a while I was reading submissions for a few publishers and I read a few things uh, that you know went on to win prizes and uh, you know stuff from big names and it's it is a, a really cool feeling of of being the first or you know one of the first people to read something that you know is going to be a very popular book um, and and you know like I think that there's a whole uh, interesting I'm sure people have written dissertations about this there's a whole interesting uh, prestige economy around around proof copies of books and who gets advanced copies of things and you know kind of the visibility of oh look I've got this new Jonathan Franzen or whatever it happens to be six months ahead you know it's 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 interesting I think it's you know you can be cynical about it of course but it's uh, it it is very interesting to see how it operates well and even even uh, parties right and you know gatherings and stuff like that you know like I've been sort of adjacent to sort of some well-known authors of, and it's like, would you like to come to our Wednesday afternoon at the pub kind of thing? And it's almost like a kind of <laughs> momentous thing to be invited into the circle. Um, yeah, you know, it's yeah. a lot of this in-person stuff. I have no idea how it's been affected by by COVID, but like that's there's all kinds of prestige in the publishing world. I mean, you know, uh, that that is around kind of in-person stuff and you know, yeah. in-group in things. And again, where you are makes a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, for sure. And so you ended up in Toronto and you ended up working for Kobo. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your work was for them. Yeah. So, um, so Kobo was really interesting for me. I, I, uh, I worked in a role that had really nothing to do with what my experience uh, should have suggested I would be doing. Um, you know, I, I had been building eBooks by and large for several years at that point. And then this job came up, which was in the content analytics department, uh, which sort of later came became part of the big data team. And one of the things that I learned, you know, from scratch, which I think is the best way to learn learn something uh, at a new job is I, I learned about data and I learned how to write SQL and I learned Python. And, you know, I, I kind of spent a lot of time hanging out with DBAs and with data scientists and with data engineers, product managers, all of these technical people. I'd never worked really in a, in a medium, medium to large size software company before. I think by the way, whether you, whether you consider a, a 400 person company, medium sized or large, says a lot about you. Um, but to, to my mind, this was the biggest place I'd ever worked. And, you know, by tech company standards, it's quite small, but, you know, I spent a lot of time hanging out with really smart engineers and I learned a lot. Um, 
and and basically spent my my time uh, writing a lot of SQL, building a lot of dashboards in Tableau, you know, trying to answer questions about how can we how can we turn data into business. Uh, I guess answer business questions with data, um, and so I, I learned the kind of the discipline of uh, well, I, I I like to call it data skepticism, which I which I think is a, a really important skill that I think maybe needs to be taught more widely. Which is you know just because you have data doesn't mean it's useful, or it doesn't mean it tells you what what you think it means. Um, so so yeah, I, I learned a lot at that job and, and got to do some kind of product management type stuff. Worked very closely with the executive team in in terms of doing research projects. Uh, so I had a lot of opportunities there to kind of see Kobo's business from A to Z. I had access to everything, um, and so it was a very privileged position to be in in many ways. To you know kind of see the the entire user base data, whatever I wanted to, to play around with it. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And I think for people, there might be people listening who are like, what, what, what does an ebook company need data for? What, what kind of, what, what kind of research projects would one be doing for a company that distributes ebooks? And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about dive in a little bit to like the, 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 the actual kind of projects you would have been working on and how, how yeah. Kobo was, what kind of data Kobo was gathering and how they were using it to yeah, know, for help, sure. help customers and, you know, determine what to do next kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. So one of the things I didn't realize when I started working at Kobo, I mean, I sort of knew this conceptually, but I'd never seen it in in person was just how much data gets generated when uh, when you visit a website or when you use things, um, you know, when you use software or, or hardware. Um, and and so Kobo is interesting in that they have a number of different business business models, you know. So there's kind of the hardware business where they make e-readers, obviously, um, and then there is an e-commerce business where they sell e-books and audio books. Uh, and then there's also a, a a very important sort of partnership aspect to it in that. You know, most of uh, Kobo has many partners throughout the world who they work with very closely. Some of them are extremely tightly integrated with Kobo's ecosystem indeed. And so there's a lot of, you know, uh, it's not, I don't know if I'd call it software as a service, but there's also, there's a lot of uh, development of software in sort of a generic sense for use by partners and all over the world. So there's kind of, I, I guess there's those three aspects of it. And there's also the self-publishing arm as well. So there's a, a, a division called Kobo Writing Life. Plus there's, uh, there's, there's now original content as well. So there's just a whole bunch of stuff going on. Um, but the, the core of it is really, it's a big e-commerce website, you know? Um, and so you have a lot of, uh, a lot of folks from the marketing team who are interested in, you know, did our ads perform well? Um, how are, how's our email marketing doing? You know, which products are performing better than others? How do we serve recommendations? Uh, some of the most interesting stuff that the data science team is working on is, you know, product recommendations, which is kind of a, that's a whole domain of data science, but we have some really smart people working on, uh, you know, the cold start problem, for example, when somebody joins your service, how do you give them a recommendation when you know nothing about them or, you know, in, and that often translates into how do you, uh, how do you get somebody to give you information about their tastes that can then be used to serve them recommendations. So there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. There's kind of practical stuff like financial records. Um, but there's also a lot of conceptual stuff like, you know, if we have such and such data, can we predict, uh, behavior X, Y, or Z. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of kind of looking for patterns in data and kind of, that's, I guess what you would call more like classical big data, uh, analysis where you're, you know, looking for pure relationships between things. Uh, yeah, thanks and there's that. of course textual analysis. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. There's also, no. you know, you have this huge corpus of, of books as well. And, um, so, you know, you can, and, and in fact, they do do a lot of textual analysis to do things like looking for books that might not be age appropriate that are trying to slip under the radar or, you know, word counts, all that kind of thing. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 that's okay. I, I, I was interrupting you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, it's, it's really fascinating. This actually brings up um, a kind of like really deep issue in the publishing world, which is a lot of people, you know, most people, like even if they're not into the book publishing industry kind of theory and practice and stuff like that are aware of the fact that Amazon is a huge dominant player in the, se in the discovery and in the selling of books. And so a lot of people yeah. think, huh, you know, the, the publishers have really ceded a lot of autonomy to Amazon as a place where books are sold, right? So if you want to sell your books, you have to 
go through Amazon. And there's just all kinds of obvious sort of, you know, implications for the, the sort of things yeah. you've given up by doing that. But the data side of it is hugely important, right? Because what what happens when you sell your, your big publisher, you're selling, let's say, millions of books a year, but Amazon knows everything. They know who the customers are. They know where the customers are from. They know what other things the customers have bought. They know how frequently they buy things. They know what subjects they're buying. They know Amazon has all that information about yeah. essentially your your readers, but as the publishing company, you don't have it. So it's not just kind of control over like the sort of really big, big ticket things like pricing and stuff like that, that or or distribution, which the Amazon can throttle if they want to kind of thing. It's this, yeah. this all the stuff you were just talking about. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's a really obvious kind of like, you know, opportunity for a company that has all that information to actually, you know, bring on publishers as clients, you know, you know, to yeah. kind of, you know, if they, if they can pay for a service that they can then access some of that information and use it in various ways to decide, you know, oh, vampires are over, it's werewolves now, you know, like, <laughs> you know, to be yeah. a funny example. Yeah, I, I, I think... I, and I think a lot of this comes from the fact that publishing is still grappling with the fact that we are moving from what is essentially a, what was essentially a B2B business, you know, selling to bookstores. And we're now in a world where we sort of have a, a mixture of B2B and B2C. And, you know, one solution to that is to lean on B2C. And, and that's why you hear people talking about email marketing so much, you know, uh, Sam Missingham, for example, is a, a friend and, and she, you, you'll often hear her talking about the importance of, having a good email list that's kind of like the start but you know beyond that you you want to try and uh have as close a relationship with your pub sorry with your customers as possible as as a publisher and and so you see a lot of smaller presses now offer subscriptions and actually that's something that we do at tilted access and have found that it's been really really good for brand loyalty and and you know for kind of people feeling that close connection with us and what we're publishing so i think you want to be as close to your your end customers as possible. But at the same time, you know, most of your money is coming from bookstores. Um, and so you, you can't neglect them either. So it's become a much more complicated business. And, you know, I, I, when I was younger, I used to be very critical of publishers and, and I used to think, yeah, well, you know, why did you see this business to Amazon and, and why do you do such and such? And as I've got older and more experienced, I've realized that, you know, there's only so many things you can you can do in a day and, and uh, you know, I, people make decisions about where to focus their efforts. I don't always agree with the way publishing has, has focused on things. And I think tech literacy is a real problem uh, still, but, but, you know, you can sort of see why somebody comes and offers you this solution to a difficult problem on a silver platter. And you're like, Oh yes, I'll have one of those. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So this is just a total, like, what's your, what's your opinion kind of question, but why do you think that tech literacy is and has been such a particular problem for the book publishing world? Yeah, I, I think there is, this is such an interesting question. And this is one that I talk about with my students a lot. Um, in, until fairly recently, I was, I was teaching with uh, my friend Monique Mongeon, uh a course at, at Ryerson University on, on book publishing, or sorry, specifically making ebooks. And one of the things that we always had to address was students would come in feeling very anxious and feeling, oh, you know, I'm not technical. I don't have any of these skills. This is going to be so hard for me. And so the first three, four weeks of the course are really just designed to show the students, look, you can write HTML. Anyone can write HTML. And now you can write some CSS. And now you can write a little bit of XML. And look, you've got an EPUB. Um, a lot of it is like dispelling this this fear. And I think a lot of it comes from, from school when people are told like, Oh, well, you're good at English. Therefore you can't be good at mathematics or, or whatever. I think, I think people tend to divide themselves into these, into these two camps. And you can even go back to like CP snow talking about the two cultures of the, the technical cultures, the scientific culture and the literary culture. So I think it's like a very deep division in, in especially in Western societies is this idea that you can be good at, uh, you know, the technical things, or you may be good at the literary things, but but not both. And I, I just think that's categorically untrue. I, I don't agree with that at all. Yeah, I could talk about that forever. I call it I call it the myth of incompatible talents. Um, yeah, which oh, is, I like that. Which is yeah, that that I mean, it's I've had this experience in my life, right? I wrote a doctorate in English literature and then became an investment banker doing you know high level financial modeling and stuff like that, right? Which was essentially yeah. kind of functional programming. And yeah, you the the sort of like there's the and it, it's sort of really it actually is kind of sad to see people when they're caught up in in this myth, right? Where they think that because I'm good at this, I'm going to be bad at that. And they so they don't yeah. even try or they even self-sabotage to kind of reinforce this preconception that they go in with. 
but I once actually, it's, I once had the experience of having a good friend who had kind of the opposite, even more tragic problem was thinking that because he was bad at one thing, he was good at the incompatible thing, right? Um, <laughs> which is, which is something that you, that you get. So there are people who will like, and you get that. Yeah. Unfortunately you do get this particularly well there. I mean, I won't specify any particular kind of subculture, but like people who boast about being bad at math as though that's yeah. somehow proof that they're a literary person. Well, I actually, I'm singling it out. Um, that's, you, know, that, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, and, and, um, and that's, that's like, it's, it's just when you, when you've freed yourself from the nets of this myth, you know, you see people caught up in it and it, and, and you see people reinforcing it as well. Oh, you know, you're, you're good at math. So we're not going to read your poem or take it seriously yeah. or something yeah. like that. Right. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, you know, like some of the, some of the best engineers that I worked with at Kobo, weren't necessarily the people who wrote the most lines of code, but they were the ones who could actually communicate what they were doing to their colleagues. And I realized, you know, a couple of years ago that the, the hardest thing to do is to communicate um, in any field, but especially in technical fields. And so if you come to that with, with a background where you have got some training in the literary arts, you actually have a real advantage. And that's why you see, I think so many Engl people from an English background making you know making really great contributions as like product managers and and or you know as, as developers or whoever um i think there's i think there are a lot of transferable skills it's just and part of part of the co the culture of tech is partly to blame for that as well i think you know i, I have a uh a, a friend emma barnes who who runs a, a fantastic book metadata service called consonants she has uh she's often talking about how you know you read documentation and says just do this this is really simple this will simply do this and of course if you're reading this and you run into like a java runtime error when you're trying to install something that the documentation says is as easy as pie it does make you feel stupid and it does reinforce those things you know and so but but of course when you're in the position of having done something for years and already solved all of those annoying you know, issues, you are in the habit of thinking it's easy, but you've got to put yourself in the position of, okay, you know, uh, this isn't, this, this isn't easy just because it's easy on my machine. It's not easy on your machine or, you know, with your experience, with your background. So. Yeah. Nothing, nothing makes you yell at the, uh, computer more than, um, conceited instructions. You know, you, you'll yeah, find this yeah. on message boards where people are like, how do you do this? And someone will go, Oh, you just flanged the bluster. Duh. Yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah. I, I'm asking because I don't know, right? Like, you yeah. Know? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, or else, why would you? Why would you want to do that? Problem, isn't it? Yeah, that was a yeah. total. Why would you want to do that? And it's like I didn't. Why would you waste time asking me why I want to yeah. do something that I clearly want to do? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like why would you want to? Why would you want to go to Berlin? Paris is so much nicer, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, these are common problems. I actually wanted to, to circle back a bit to what you said about data skepticism, because yeah. uh, it's something I, I haven't had that lo a lot of experience with, but I've had some, and it's um, particularly from a sort of like, you know, investment side of things where there's a phenomenon where people see particularly charts uh, mm. and they think that that must correspond to some objective reality. And it, it sounds funny to put it that way, but like, yeah. you know, if you show someone a, a chart that's a projection, that's like a hockey stick for a stock. Not that I've ever done that myself, but like yeah. they'll just oftentimes they'll just believe it. Yeah, uh, and it's it's just a weird phenomenon, and particularly numbers, numbers showing people numbers like you know that you'll see this in the publishing world where it's like some 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 management consultancy puts out a projection that we project that the cumulative cumulative aggr aggregate you know growth rate for the publishing industry in the next five years will be three point two five percent, and it's like yeah, oh, yeah. The second decimal, right? <laughs> you know what's going to happen in five years? Yeah, um, I love that, and you look and and it's just like a it's just a straight line. It's like oh okay, so you've just taken this number and multiplied it by like 0.0325 you know it's it's not it's not necessarily that sophisticated yeah but but yeah. but our cumulative annual growth rate sorry it's the kager but um uh but yeah but people there's a whole industry of people just providing numbers that are complete bullshit uh and yeah it's 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 weird because we, we understand why right it's like people who are making decisions can't just hand wave it's nice for them to have a report with numbers in it to point to yeah but it's really easy even even if you know better to kind of slip over into being overly certain about anything yeah. that comes in the form of numbers and charts which i think is a i imagine like a huge challenge for anyone whose job is to not just manage data but to present their findings 
Yeah. So yeah, exactly. And the I, I ran into this challenge a few times at Kerbo because once you've once you've proven that you know how to write SQL, the next question is like, oh, okay, well, I want a prediction for such and such a business or such and such a thing. And so I, I realized that you know I could give somebody a number that said a hundred thousand dollars, or I could give them a number that said a million dollars, and both would be taken as equally plausible. And 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 I realized that the only way to really do this in an intellectually honest way, I think, is to be really, really explicit about what your inputs are and, and what your assumptions are. And I started I started basically giving, you know, and then you, you end up in a case where you give people a low case and a high case and a medium case. But even that implies a degree of certainty that, that isn't really there. But I realized that the best way to present an uncertain uh you know, an uncertain uh, calculation is to show how many confounding variables there are. And so, you know, I, I would usually highlight those things in yellow in a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. And so you've got like, it's like, oh, wow, there's 15 different inputs and each one of them can change the output by, you know, three times. And I'm like, yes, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, you can, you can make some reasonable assumptions, but ultimately, uh, ultimately you have to take a guess a lot of the time. And that's, that's hard in business. People want to have definite answers, but sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta make a guess. And yeah. And hope you, that you're right. <laughs> yeah. You get the weird second guessing that happens too. If you, I mean, I've had that, that sort of same experience where like you try to be intellectual. I mean, of course you're always trying to be intellectually honest about things. Right. But you know, if you show people how much uncertainty there is behind the prediction they've they're expecting or they've asked for, they often feel like that's, they might feel like that's because you're not good at it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you, there's a real yeah. balancing act, right? Because you are good at it. You really do understand it better than they do. And you know what's going on. But there are pe if people have this expectation of certainty and you present them with uncertainty, they might think, oh, well, we, we just need to keep working at it. And yeah, real hard thing is to convey to people, no, this is just an inherently uncertain thing. But once you've been behind yeah. the curtain, you know, you, you see these projections and things like that, whether it's a, a government budget or, a, you know, an industry projection or something like that. And you're like, yeah, there's somebody, somebody had an Excel spreadsheet and they typed some numbers in it. And then there was a meeting about, should we use those numbers or other numbers? And then those numbers were yeah. on. And that's the basis <laughs> for that projection. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, I used to be responsible for a big part of the inputs for the financial forecasting for, for Kobo, and you know that that was a fascinating process because you know there is there are multiple layers of, of stakeholders, and you know it's it's an important process, and ultimately at the end of the day, you're saying, well, this is my best effort, and you know there are a few times that I I got it wrong, and uh, I got it wrong, you know, quite uh, spectacularly on on one occasion that I can't really talk about, but you know. It, it, all you can do is say, look, these are, these were my assumptions and this was the one that was wrong. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you gotta be humble and say, look, I'm, I'm not perfect at this, but, uh, I'll, I'll try to be honest with you about where my knowledge stops. Yeah. Sympathy. You're getting any, any, anyone in an analysis role out there, you have, you have our <laughs> sympathies. Um, yeah. Just, just shifting gears a bit. Uh, uh, so Tilted Access Press, you're a co-founder of it. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that for a moment, how it, how it came about and, and what it, what it does. Yeah. So, so Tilted Access, um, I can't take any credit for the idea for the press itself. Um, essentially, the way it came about was uh, I I knew a, a translator called Deborah Smith. Uh, we had interned at the same publisher back in 2014, something or other, and uh, she came to me and said, "Look, I'm I need a technical person to help me set up this press that I want to build, and uh, you know, would you be interested in doing it?" And essentially, the idea is that it it De Deborah uh, is a is a translator from Korean, and she translated a book called The Vegetarian that went on to win the uh, Booker International Prize in 2016 and became actually very very successful, especially in the US. and uh, And she has this network of translator colleagues all over the world. It's a very tight knit community, the translation community. and And she realized that you know a lot of books, especially from Asian languages, were you know, there were translators there who were willing to do the work. Um, in some cases, even funding from the governments of those countries. And a lot of publishers, uh, particularly in the UK and the US, just weren't interested or they could only do so many per year. And, and there's just so much great literature being published um, that, that just wasn't making it over to especially the UK. And so we started out with this brief of essentially focusing on work and translation largely from Asian languages. And so we published, uh, you know, books translated from Bengali and from from Thai and Japanese um, and 
languages that you know for in some cases like uh one of one of the books that we published was we think was the first uh book translated from thai to be published in the united kingdom um as a, as a commercial as a commercial fiction book and you know this was this was like 2018 and, and this is the first time this is happening it's it's kind of crazy so wow. so yeah anyway deborah had some money from the booker prize and and she put that into into tilted access and yeah we've been uh distributed team since day one so we've never had an office um we've met in person you know like i could count the number of times on on one or two hands um and we have team members all over the world deborah's living uh in india right now we have team members in the uk and you know it's like a classic uh distributed team now um but yeah we've just published our 20th uh book and we've done poetry we've done all kinds of all kinds of fun stuff. So it's, it's great because it's completely different from the uh, commercial publishing world that I spend most of my time in. And it's, it's, it's the ap- absolute opposite end of the spectrum, like very indie art house uh, publishing. That is, you know, something that we do because we think it's important. Uh, yeah. And how do you distribute your, how do you sell your books? Mm. So we, we have a fantastic uh, sales agency called InPress in the UK. So they they represent a lot of uh, poetry publishers. They they have a couple of hundred uh, clients, I think. And so they're our sales agency. Um, and then we have a we have a distribution uh, a distributor called uh, NBNI, who were recently acquired by Ingram. So I think they're now called Ingram Publisher Services in the UK. Uh, so they do our distribution. Um, and and yeah, you know, we kind of print in the UK with usually in the UK with, with clays and uh, basically we're, we're a standard publisher in some senses and we're very different in others. And that was like a conscious decision because we wanted to figure out where are the things where we can save costs and, and essentially outsource these services that we don't want to provide ourselves. Sales is obviously one of them where you get uh, economies of scale, printing, uh, distribution, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we do obviously our own editorial work in house. I make all the eBooks and run the website and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it, it's it's a traditional publisher from the sales and distribution point onwards, but everything else is a bit different up to that point. Uh, this is, I think, probably a good opportunity to segue into the part of the podcast where we talk about how the pandemic has affected the the guest and uh, their work. Um, and so let's well, why don't we start by uh, hearing about how the pandemic has affected your your indie press. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, to be honest, nothing has really changed for Tilted Access. Uh, we, although one of my colleagues is currently ill with the coronavirus in the UK, I think she's on the road to recovery. But um, yeah, I, I shouldn't say nothing has happened. It's it's obviously affected us personally uh, from a from a business standpoint. Really, though, nothing nothing much has changed. We've had a little bit of trouble getting getting print runs uh, fulfilled recently. We had a few ship dates. Uh, a few dates slip, but uh, by and large, we were already a distributed team, so it, it hasn't really changed that much. Um, and you know, I guess the other thing is that the timelines are so long that uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't really we, like we're only starting to feel the effects of coronavirus on our commissioning now, I guess, um, and then for our 2021 list. But yeah, I, I think sales this year have been good. We were lucky. One of our books won the National Book Award for Translated Fiction in the U.S. recently. It's called Tokyo Ueno Station. Um, so we we uh, had this book translated and we sold the U.S. and Canadian rights to uh, uh, to Riverhead in the U.S. And so they they put all this publicity muscle behind it. They created this beautiful cover and uh, and they got a National Book Award. So that that book has actually done fantastically well for us this year. Um, so yeah, we you know we uh, fortunately have been very much unscathed by the pandemic. We've been very very fortunate. Uh, best wishes to your colleague for a speedy recovery. Um, uh, and I was wondering too, um, what what life has just been like in in Toronto under the pandemic? I mean, I know it like it. Well, speaking of timelines, it's now been a really long time. When I started asking this question, it was only like a month in, to, uh, but now it's been quite a bit longer than that. Um, and Toronto, yeah. Toronto, like well, Ontario just went into a new lockdown phase. So I was wondering if you could just give us a general impression of what life's been like for you in Toronto since since things started in basically March. Yeah. So as of, I think tomorrow, it's been like 10 months of lockdown for, for I mean, Toronto, although we did have a period in the summer when it was, uh, was less severe and we could meet people outside. Excuse me. Um, 
but I mean, again, like I, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to work remotely uh, the whole time for Kobo and then for my for my new job since uh, since mid December. Uh, my wife is also working remotely, so we're kind of on opposite sides of the kitchen table. And um, you know, sometimes people are like, "I can see your hands, but somebody's typing. Like, what's going on?" It's like, well, my wife is sixty centimeters away, so that's probably what you can hear. Um, but yeah, it, it's we we have been very fortunate in that we can work remotely and, you know, I've, I've picked up uh, baking sourdough this year and, and started running and that's about all that's changed in the last year. Baking. Oh, sourdough, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a bit late to the game, but I just got, I'm just showing you this, this classic Italian baking book. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That looks nice. Yeah, fantastic. It's called the Italian baker. I recommend it to anyone who's, uh, who's interested. Um, but yeah, and I just, this one, just before we move on to talking about your new job um, was I'm curious about masks where I live in Victoria, Vancouver Island, people didn't actually start wearing masks outside until quite recently. Um, and even now it's like, it's not, it's not a requirement and it's maybe like one quarter of people will do that. Uh, what was it like in, in Toronto generally around masks? Yeah, well, it, it's funny because uh, uh, I have a good friend in Hong Kong who was trying to tell us back in February, you know, she, she or January, she was like, you know, this is this is real, this is going to affect you, and we didn't really believe her, but uh, but but I think Toronto has been pretty good about wearing masks uh, since the beginning. I think, I mean, it, it took a little while for people to get used to it, but I think we're probably doing pretty well. Um, you know, you still do see a few people who are, aren't wearing masks when they should, but I'd say 95% of people are uh, doing a pretty good job of wearing masks indoors and outdoors. Now, I, I see increasingly people are wearing masks outdoors, and I think, you know, it, it can't hurt. So, uh, yeah, I, I – but, yeah, it, it's very hard to, to know quite uh, – I, I guess when, when social change happens like that, it's it's really interesting because my, my family's back in Australia, and uh, and the, the contrast could not be – starker um i don't know if that's the right way of saying that but the, the contrast could not be more telling you know um in australia like my sister was at an in-person wedding last week for example and like life is completely back to normal in for most most people so uh it, it does kind of like they're at the beach right now <laughs> um so it does kind of kind of make me wish that canada had done a a better job of locking down more aggressively, but I also think you know we share a border with uh, uh, with our with our dear friends down down south who probably would have been acting as a viral pump for us uh, no matter what we did. So I don't know. I'm I'm not a I'm not I'm not an epidemiologist, you know, so I, I shouldn't really uh, have opinions about that sort of thing. Yeah, no, no, I think it's, I mean, we've all been thinking about it for a long time, right? And it's, you know, you've got to, regardless of one's expertise, you have to some come to some conclusion about how you think you should behave and other people should behave. And, you know, my position has been, yeah, that like, you know, I started, I started being concerned about it, I think. And, you know, when you're in kind of like the tech world, you people were a little bit more aware of it, I think, than, than in other worlds in advance. And, um, but my approach to it is that, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll wear, I'll start wearing one outside when it tips over to the point where people are like, other people are concerned about it, but personally, yeah. specifically here on Vancouver Island and in, in the city of Victoria, I just didn't think it was worth it. But like the moment, the moment it tips over to like, Hey buddy, like put on a mat, like no problem at all. Yeah. Like it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't hurt at all. Uh, but uh, any, everyone's got to kind of, I'm no epidemiologist either, but every, everybody's got to come to their own, their own conclusion. In yeah. That anyway. Um, well, it's interesting because I, I remember talking to a friend who is an infectious diseases specialist, actually, and, you know, knows knows things about transmission of disease. And I, I remember asking him, you remember back at the beginning, there was this whole debate about whether masks were effective and, and whether people should be wearing them or not and you know whether the general public should wear masks. And I remember asking him and he said, well, you know, it, it you probably don't need to. And that was the conventional wisdom a year ago, you know, um, at least in – with a lot of uh, at least a lot of English speaking doctors, I think. And I think it's an interesting example of how, um, you know, particularly in uh, in Asian countries, mask wearing was very much the norm. And I think there's probably a failure to learn from that experience, uh, you know, and, and, and on the part of Western doctors, they probably could have uh, learned from from what their colleagues in, in Asia knew already. Yeah, there's a really, I mean, this is this really deep subject that we could talk about forever too. But, yeah. um, but you know, the thing is that my understanding is that typically in Asia, mask wearing was adopted as a form of being responsible towards other people, right? You, you didn't wear it 
because you were afraid of getting something. You wore yeah. it because you didn't want to spread whatever you thought you might have. And people, particularly in in North America, and and you know maybe even particularly our friends to the south here, um, don't didn't viewed it quite differently. They viewed it as as an expression. A lot of people viewed wearing a mask as an expression of fear and a protective thing. Um, yeah, it was it was just a sort of like mirror image of what 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 the the way people in Asia typically viewed mask wearing, which was like I'm trying I'm trying to help other people out. That's what yeah. That's why I'm wearing it. it it's yeah. not. It's not. It, it wasn't viewed as like an infringement of your freedom. It was something you adopted, just like washing your hands before you serve food. You know, like it was just a, a normal thing to do. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And I, I always thought like I. I noticed, especially at the start, a few people wearing masks with vents. And I was thinking like, well, what's the point of that? You know, <laughs> but, but of course, if you think of the mask as protecting you, then, then that's, that, that makes sense. But, but, you know, from the perspective of like, it, it's meant to be a barrier to transmission in both directions, then a, a mask with a vent is kind of only really serving half the purpose it's meant to serve. Yeah, I, I actually had one of those initially. Not, not. I wasn't like an, someone gave it to me. I wasn't an expert, and it was, it was, it was. Well, people were people were learning, right? And it was, um, it was a yeah, construction yeah. mask. So the idea was right. that, like, it was designed for the purpose of protecting you from a damage, yeah, of course, damaging yeah. stuff in the environment around you. But you know, people were. Yeah. People, I think a lot. I think most people who wore those, like me, thought didn't realize that, like, actually, you know, yeah. this wasn't this wasn't helping other people at all. Um, but you, learned, yeah, right. So absolutely, yeah. Um, and so, uh. Moving back to your uh, career, so you've, you're starting a new, or you've already started a new job with um, Textbook Hub, and yeah. I, as I gather, you're going to be moving to Vancouver relatively, relatively yeah. soon. Um, yep. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what Textbook Hub does and what you're going to be doing for them. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So essentially, uh, Textbook Hub is a digital textbook platform for uh, independent and parochial schools. That's kind of the, the core business in, uh, in the U.S., and there are sort of two value propositions. One of them is we have this fantastic uh, annotation platform where, you know, we, we can serve book content to you in our own reading experience. And you can, as a student or as, a, as an instructor, you can annotate it and you can, you know, add notes, you can add hyperlinks, you can draw on the pages, whatever you want to do. And then you can share those annotations with other people in your class, um, you know, other students or, or instructors. And so there's that reading experience, but we also have, you know, the fact is that the digital textbook world is quite a messy space. So there's a lot of other publishers who have their own reading systems. And so we integrate into them as well. And so we kind of provide like a single sign on service for those books where they aren't in our platform. So it's, it's kind of the idea is that, you know, there's the student or the instructor logs into this one place. They have all of their books there. If the book's hosted on an external service, we make it as easy as possible for them to go out and access that content. And rather than somebody having to have, you know, a dozen different logins to a dozen different websites because there's 12 different publishers all trying to kind of maintain their own walled garden. Um, one of the things that that I've learned and and educational publishing is new to me, but I've been I've been in trade publishing for a long time, um, is that you know this is a quite a messy space. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of products where it's not quite clear how things integrate with each other. You know, does your product integrate with such and such learning management system? Does it get information from student integration systems? Do you have SSO into like, it's, it's a really complex space. And I think it's one of the things that we offer that schools seem to really like is simplification of that. Whereas it's where it's like, they send us a list of books and we go and get the books and they don't have to worry about that. Um, and so my role is essentially I'm, I'm the, the first person on the team to focus specifically on publisher relationships. My role is to go and get as much content as I can uh, and to kind of work on those integrations with publishers. And so, you know, I'll be doing everything from uh, the kind of business relationships, contract negotiation, that kind of level of things, all the way down to, you know, um, QAing the EPUB files that get delivered. Because again, this is my background in ebook production i love to keep my ha get my hands on the on the files themselves and and review the epubs and make sure they're good and also a, a big thing that we're that we're working on is metadata you know um especially the the classic uh book book industry problem of you know price information being wrong um getting getting good metadata in from all of our partners is is a really big challenge so that's something that i'm working on right now 
And uh, what's the uh, sort of customer range for Textbook Hub? Is it is it Canada? Is it British Columbia? Is it the whole world? Yeah, right now, right now we're US only. Okay. Um, so so yeah, uh, obviously at some point in the future we might want to expand that, but uh, for now it's US only. Pretty big market. Um, <laughs> yeah, huge, huge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, simplification sounds like a really important thing to focus on. I mean, particularly you know with people switching to remote learning in so many instances in the last you know ten months. You know. The idea of making things simple and workable has, I think, yeah. probably become a higher priority for people because, you know, like there's, there's things that can be done in person that you kind of cludge together that you just have to find a solution for when you're doing them, them remotely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think one of the other things that it gives you is that you are free to change your textbook at any time or you're, you know, often, often schools are increasingly renting textbooks for, you know, a semester or for two semesters. And so rather than, you know, the school investing in a physical textbook, which is expected to last for four years um, and having to kind of have this lumpy budgeting where you have like a big investment in, in the product one year and then nothing the next years, you know, you, you have, you, you have the content you need for one year. And if you need to change that, then you don't have this, this pile of textbooks that you kind of have to use. Um, so it gives you more flexibility in that sense. And, uh, from, from, we've done some research into, uh, why schools are adopting digital textbooks and kind of what percentage of their textbooks are adopted. And a lot of schools are saying that they actually, they do save money this way because they can kind of get a more granular, uh, unit of textbook, if, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's still very variable. So some schools have got, you know, like 10 or 15% digital textbooks and everything else is print. Others are like the other extreme where they have 90%. Even one school taught us they have 95% digital textbooks. So it, it's kind of all over the map. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, it, it gives them more, more flexibility and, and save some money. Yeah, it's really a really interesting topic, the idea of being able to update the textbooks that the students are using. Um, you know, I'm, this is definitely not an area of my expertise, but I've had some experience with it from the student side of things. And, you know, with print, often an experience you'll have in a classroom, particularly in universities, I guess, is people have different versions. So you, when you try and this sounds like a really technical thing, but it's actually a very sort of significant real world problem where you say, you know, go to page 231 yeah. and people are on different looking at different things because they're in different versions. And the idea, one of the, one of the great things and in, in my view about sort of digital books is that since things can be updated for everyone, particularly if they've sort of subscribed to a service or something like that's the portal through which yeah. they're viewing something, you can just be sure everyone's on the same page. And that's actually like, it's really important. It's as important as synchronizing your watches, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, but it's funny though, I, I still think that uh, this is one of these things where I, I feel like, uh, we haven't done enough, a good enough job as a publishing industry in terms of actually adopting some of the standards that are available to us. So this is, I mean, you've touched on one of my, my personal pet peeves is that, you know, in the EPUB spec, you can, you can put a page list in place so that you can have the ebook tied exactly to where the, the print book, uh, each page on the print book starts and ends, you know, so you can, you can easily locate, uh, in theory, you can easily locate every digital, uh, every ebook, no matter what font size you're at or whatever to a specific print page. But the reality is that um, very, very few publishers are doing that. And partly that's because the tooling's not good enough. You know, like InDesign doesn't automatically create pages lists for you. It's a, it's a bit of a headache to do them. Um, and, and I guess people aren't making enough noise asking for them. So at least in the trade world, most books, most ebooks, even the ones published today still don't have page lists in them, which I think is a real shame because uh, it's a very, have you know page numbers are a really critical navigational tool that that I think uh, we we haven't moved past the need for uh, if, if that makes sense it, it does it does I mean you reminded me that you know it's it's this also a big problem for academic research right where you're doing citations right because it's, yeah. it's just a big problem like what what version if you're citing an ebook it's like maybe it's changed a hundred times since you cited yeah. it you know do you have to have a specific file stored somewhere and point to that well how often is that really going to happen i mean these are these are really big 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 problems and you know i don't know how soon any of them are going to go away um yeah 
just moving on maybe to the last part of the interview, interview where you talk a little bit about your views generally about, about the publishing industry. Um, one thing you've worked on in the past is getting interns paid. Yeah. This is a, this is an issue and it's an issue in journalism and it's an issue in, in, in publishing as well, where there's often a convention that, you know, an intern might be in mean in journalism that they're often paid nothing or, or in, in various industries, they might be sort of poorly paid. And what that means is that basically it means a lot of different things, which you would know much better than me and have more experience with. But, you know, one thing it might mean is that only if you're already kind of financially well off, can you get started in an industry, right? Because yeah, absolutely. A of unpaid work. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your what the work you've done with respect to uh, getting interns paid. And how do you think, do you think that the, the sort of shift towards more remote working is going to have any impact on that? Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting question. I, I think it, it, I'm really hardened by how quickly uh, opinion has changed over over internships. You know, I mean, probably six years ago when when people were starting to talk about this, and and I I wrote a couple of articles for the bookseller in the UK, and um, we you know the the norm was that most internships were unpaid, and even at at big publishers, um, you know, even at some of the big five publishers. You, you wouldn't get paid for internships. That was just kind of the way it had always been. And the problem, of course, is that you don't have any bargaining power if you're the intern and you you are reliant on on somebody to, to give you that job. And, and so, of course, you're not going to make a fuss. You're not going to kick up a stink about not having been paid. The idea is, you know, you should be grateful just to be in the door. Um, and I, I think people are starting to realize how, how much of a negative effect that's had on uh, on, on diversity in the industry, because, you know, especially if the interns have to be working in London, they're already in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Same goes with New York publishing, of course. Um, you know, I, I, I have friends who for the first couple of years of their publishing careers, they worked second jobs um, to make ends meet. And to me, if that, 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 that should tell you something about the industry, I think. And things are definitely improving. You know, you've seen especially big five publishers starting to commit to sort of baseline levels of pay. Um, I think things are moving much faster than I expected them to, but there was a lot of resistance at first because there was that old guard of people who had kind of been through it and they they were sort of in, of the opinion that, well, you know, you're getting all this value out of this internship and you're learning so much and, and you know, it's like a mini degree or whatever. Um but and, and so there were some uncomfortable conversations and my strategy was always to, you know, sort of confront people publicly about that, which was maybe I, I just like to stir things up a bit. Maybe that's my Australian nature. But uh, but there's nothing a British person hates more than being uh, <laughs> more than being publicly called out for something. Um, and, and I think that's also, you know, that's, you know, you can talk about Twitter culture and all of that. It, it's it, it's not always constructive, but I think if you, if you handle it in a targeted way and, and if you give people an option to do the right thing, I think it's, it's a very powerful tool because, you know, publishers are acutely aware of their, of their image. And so, you know, it doesn't look good to have people saying, well, you know, you're an X billion dollar company. Why aren't you paying your interns who are working so hard for you? So I, I think we've, I, I think I would, from what I can tell, you know, unpaid internships are, are much less prevalent now. I think they've gone underground in, in a certain sense. I think they're no longer advertised openly. And so they're kind of harder to combat now um, because I think they're sort of on private mailing lists and, you know, um, you know, and you're, if you're on your publishing master's program, maybe somebody, somebody emails your class. That's the kind of thing that's much less public. And there are still networks of privilege operating that way. You know, uh, in many ways, getting a master's degree is a way of, of uh, exercising your privilege. And so I, I'm not exempt from that by any means, but yeah, I think we are moving in the right direction. It's just, it's just as with anything in publishing, it's taken twice or three times as long as it should. And do you think um, a shift towards remote work? I mean, I, like I just came up with that question like on the fly, so I'm not sure if it's even really meaningful, but you know, is, is that like, I just have a suspicion that it might be easier for people to get away with, you know, using people for unpaid internship work when it's remote. Possibly. Yeah, possibly. I mean, yeah, I, I did one or two unpaid internships at the start of my career that were largely remote. And I think uh, it, it certainly, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the problem. This is the, the classic, the reason unpaid internships exist, I think, is because people are so kind of desperate to get their foot in the door, particularly in industries like publishing and other cultural industries. I'm sure it's the same in the film and TV industries, you know, the, the, Industries that have that kind of social prestige, I think you will always find young people who are willing to uh, work for nothing. And, and I think it it sort of comes up to the employers to behave responsibly uh, in, in that sense. But, yeah, I mean, I think 
remote you, you can onboard people remotely and you can teach people things remotely, but it's hard. Like uh, at Cobra, we, we hired a bunch of people remotely, uh, you know, during the pandemic. I think, I think four of my colleagues on my team uh, had been hired uh, remotely and it's, it's hard to onboard people and get to know them that way. It really is. Uh, I guess my last question would be um, get, given, given the fact that all predictions are based on assumptions, <laughs> uh, do you have any big predictions for 2021 in the book publishing world? Um, oh, that's a great question. I think we are going to see more and more kind of movement in the automated typesetting space. I think that's something that's been flying under the radar a little bit. Um, there's a bunch of interesting work going on. I mean, you guys at, at LeanPub obviously have your your tool chain. Uh, there's a, a very interesting call, tool called Heteris, which I think is, is launched now. Um, that is a, another fantastic tool. I think accessibility is going to increasingly become important. I think publishers are, are starting to see the commercial value in it, not just the moral imperative, but also the commercial value. Um, and I think hopefully uh, uh, this is maybe a bit more wishful thinking, but you know, there's, there's an audiobook spec now, and I think we are hopefully going to move beyond the world of, uh, you know, bundles of mp3 files being sent around with a word document uh, into a world where we have a properly spec uh spec audio audio format uh largely thanks to uh to wendy reed who is an old colleague of mine at kobo and wrote uh, did a lot of work on the draft of the audio spec that's just been published so i i feel optimistic about this year in publishing actually i mean it was it, it's sort of one of those awkward things where a lot of publishers did well last year. You know, Kobo had a very good year. Um, you know, a friend at Lightning Source tells me they had a very good year as well. Uh, people are turning to books. It's it's sort of one of these re recession uh, averse businesses where, you know, even though books are actually quite expensive now, as in terms of uh, people's purchasing power, I think I think people do have a special. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be in this business if I didn't think that there was something special about the the written word. Um, so I, I feel like it's a, I'm excited about what's, what's happening this year, but I don't know if I can predict it beyond a few technical things like that. Well, it's always nice to end on an optimistic note. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for taking the time uh, out of your day to be with us here on, on the podcast. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much for being a guest. Thanks very much for having me, Len. It was uh, a real pleasure and, uh, yeah, great to chat. Thanks a lot. And thanks, as always, to all of you for listening to this episode of the Front Matter Podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate and review it wherever you found it. And if you'd like to be a LeanPub author, please check out our website at leanpub.com. Thanks.